Hello. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Mukesh. I'm from Cheese Photography Magazine. Uh, time for another webinar. Today we have uh, Tim uh, in our today's web webinar session. Tim, in, Tim is international uh, well-known travel photographer. Uh, by the time he join us, uh, let me give you a brief about today's webinar. We'll be talking about the travel photography, uh, especially international travel photography. During the webinar, you can ask questions on your, on your panel. You have an option to ask question under Q and A section. Those questions will be visible to us. We will curate those questions and we'll ask uh, Tim. Please make sure that you put, you ask a detailed question, put whole question in one, like at once only. If you ask in two times, like half of the question in one window and half in the second, we would not be able to answer that because there are a lot of questions comes and uh, we will lose a track. Second, please don't put just hi, hello, good, these words. Uh, just ask very specific questions. Next thing is you need to, uh, you can raise your hand. If you think your internet is good, you can raise your hand. We will uh, invite you to ask a direct questions. Today's webinar is going to be only in English. Once the webinar is completed, you guys will get one automated mail from meetings from Joho meeting. You can use that email as a proof of participating in the workshop. And on our website, events.cheese.com, you would find under this event, you would find a link to request for a, a certificate. Once we get the request, within 24 to 48 hours, we will send you a certificate. Uh, this webinar is available for free for all. However, it is for limited participants only. Um, the tool has certain limits. We cannot accommodate more. In case if you have already joined, you're liking it, don't leave the webinar. It may happen that you are not able to, you may not be able to join it back because in next five, six minutes, this webinar uh, becomes the capacity uh, becomes like full. Uh, another important part is um, we are supporting Prime Minister's uh, relief fund. We request all of you to donate some money in that. The link is there on our website. You can go over uh, events.cheese.com and make some donation to Prime Minister Fund. The rest, if you have any question, uh, you can ask anytime, any difficulty, uh, you can ask those questions. And please don't put hi, hello, and uh, we love that, but uh, that's not the right format to do it. Please don't ask questions multiple times, same questions. If you have asked one, we will be curating those questions and then we'll be asking Tim those questions. Uh, as of now, we have, uh, like Tim is joining us. Uh, Tim is based out of Czech Republic. Uh, he would be joining us, and he would take care of, uh, like take it care, uh, take it care, uh, take care of it further.
Uh, welcome, Tim. Hi, Tim. Can you hear me? Hello, Tim. Hello. No. Hey. Hi, how are you? We can see you and we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I can hear you as well, very clear. Well, and, mm -hmm. So before you join, I have introduced yourself. Welcome, uh, Tim. Welcome once again. And uh, everyone would be on mute, including me. So anything there, I will unmute myself and ask you a question or anything. But it's over to you. Please uh, take care of the rest of the event. Thank you, Tim. Welcome once okay. again. Yeah, thank you very much. So welcome all together. I see we have a lot of attendees. So I'm, we had a little problem with the coronavirus here, <laughs> uh, technical issues, but now it's much better. So I, how you see, uh, need strongly a haircut because I just returned on 20th of March from Ethiopia. We had to... Uh, come there fast home because of the virus, but now it's all safe and we are stuck at home, but I cannot go to the hairdresser. <laughs> so my name is Tim Vollmer. I'm original from Germany and um, I started photographing and very early my neighbor was a professional photographer and my childhood I <laughs> spent more or less in the dark room to learn from him and this was very, very nice. Then I started to make my own career. I started with newspapers and with um, local um, uh, magazines to make tours and um, present them, na the nature around at home. Then I moved uh, to Iceland. This was the biggest step. I lived 11 years in Iceland. And I was, uh, or I am guilty uh, for the boom in Iceland because I worked very strongly together the first seven years with the tourism board of Iceland to promote Iceland and bring all the tourists. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, we were three photographers up there, two locals, also Icelanders, and one foreigner, me. Um, who set up photo tours now, these days, everybody goes there until the coronavirus. <laughs> but I hope this will end soon. I'm optimist. I hope it end in August, September, that we can start again to travel. Yeah, so uh, then I did hundreds of tours in Iceland with cooperation of other photographers from all over the world like Art Wolf and Nevada Via, all the top 100 I worked with from all over the world, what was very nice because in photography, it's you never learn out and every photographer has um, his strong part, what is not yours. And so you always learn from others. If everybody is able to share, then it's a wonderful thing. Then after a while, I decided to go international. So this means out of Iceland. 2013, I started strongly to make photo tours around the world alone and in cooperation with many others. I had now, until now, I organized 92 trips around the world and uh, in 87 countries and i had over 1100 happy photographers on the tour and um, this will continue after the corona break now we are stuck at home all of us and i hope all of you are safe and i i when i look here on the list i see here some names what i actually know from <laughs> from some images because I have uh, in the past many 
Indian uh, photographers who joined me on the tour and I had have I'm by myself I'm very often in India and make Indian tours or in cooperation um, so I know some of you from at least from from your own work so I came in contact with she is what I really appreciated because um, I'm open-minded and I am 20 years 27 years now in this business so I'm pretty settled and I want just to share but this means I'm open you can ask me everything I will answer it directly and I can help wherever I can help in the past I I help many photographers to come out, uh, like Kevin Pepper or Iuri from Iceland or so on there. I said, come with me, we do it together. And then we will see how your work will go and how the people loves your work and your style. And the rest I will teach you how to make tours. And now there are four already of them. Uh, their own photography instructors and I use I still do be mentor for one photography student in the world uh, who study photography to bring him on the right way it doesn't matter which way this is if instructing or commercial photography or portrait or gallery or fine art it doesn't matter I, I'm so long in the business and I work strongly with many, many uh, film from the film business and from the media and from the big names like National Geographic together. So I have very good contacts. The other thing is I decided to refuse many corporations like National Geographic. They asked me several times if I can you do photo workshops for them for National Geographic in Iceland because I knew there are every stone still of course but um, I refused it because of a single point the group size were way too big there were up to 60 or more people and one photographer this means I will get known maybe 20 by face and 10 personnel and the rest I will be able not much to speak. And this is not my style. My style is I want to have small groups or private groups, what I do very often. And I that I can teach perfectly and that I have time for every single uh, photographer. This means I will see what is his strength, what is his weakness and what he loves and what not. And then I will bring him out in out of his comfort zone to open his eye to see different views. And of course, I will strengthen his better part that he comes there several level ups in his profession that he really has something out of it. So my tours, if I do it by my own, it's maximum one to six. Also mostly the tour starts with four people. If it's private with two, if I'm alone, I take maximum six people because then I can guarantee that I have the time and I know everybody's work and I can really go not only in the field as well, with post processing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, very deeply into everyone. If I have more people joining uh, group tours, then I have good partners like Chris Marquardt or um, uh, uh, Dean Tatulis or others, uh, as well from India, who join me then like a second professional instructor that the ratio goes down one to four. So you see, there's really time. Um, with G is I make cooperations we offer now this year hopefully it will change and we can go but it looks in the moment not so good um, to Greenland and to Kyrgyzstan but we set up of course uh, for next year the same destination so Lake Baikal, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Greenland so and you saw maybe the work and you saw the, 
uh, the uh, different itineraries. So if you have there any questions, I'm ready to answer whatever pops up in your mind. And, and I try to hope, or I hope to answer all of the questions. So back to you, my friend. I see here some questions. Uh, in um, those questions, we will curate and we will ask you. So mm -hmm. uh, what we can start with, we will uh, show some of your photos. You can ask to stop at place. And if there is any story with those photos and you want to share any experience, uh, then we can uh like uh, and then at the once we are done with the half of the presentation uh, mm -hmm. around 6 15 then we will have a question answer session after curating those questions because there are so many of questions uh and some duplicate multiple people are asking so we will mm -hmm. take care of it. so uh we can we can have the next slide and you can carry on Okay, I'll, I will start to answer here some questions because they are very interesting and uh, good topics. Um, the first question what I see here is if the Greenland tour happening this year. Uh, I actually hope that it will happen. I talked with my partner Lars in, in Greenland and of course like everybody in the tourist industry hope it will open. But the main question if, is if you are allowed to leave the country and if the flights are going. So the Greenland tours, I still hope, and um, we have all set up that it will go, but um, we will see what the coronavirus will do. Um, the next question was there about Ethiopia. Yeah, this was a very sad situation because um, I was, I had three tours in a row. I was in Lake Baikal, then I had a private tour in Sri Lanka, and then I went to Ethiopia to my third tour. And there the coronavirus started to break out more and more. So um, in, in the middle of the tour, we had to break up the tour because the German embassy, I'm original Germany, from Germany, they told me we have to come back. Otherwise, it's not guaranteed that I come back uh, before May. So, of course, uh, we had other guests Germany and from Swiss there. So we, we canceled the tour and uh, sadly, wise, but um, this, um, the risk of your uh, health and to come home, it's much more important. But we all three said we just uh, redo it next year. And this is, in my case, no questions, because everybody was extremely sad when it started to get to the very good tribes like um, Hama and Sumi and uh, we couldn't go there and we all was waiting and ready and excited to go there so this tour will just uh, happen again next year again so this is um was sad but we had to do it um romania Here's a question about my Romania tour. Romania, I do mostly private um, because the interest about Romania is not so uh, uh, big because uh, there are so many destinations for photographers and the most photographers, they start on the top destinations and then they go down to uh, um, um, smaller destinations like Romania. It is sad because it is a beautiful country. So I, I will do not a group tour, but yes, I will do private tour, definitely. Minimum two people. Um, like um, what I don't ex um, um, understand is as well, I was uh, last year in December in, in the wonderful northeast of India and I know the infrastructure there is not so perfect, 
bar and the hotels are not on the best levels, but it is such a beautiful area to photograph. And on the other side, if it's not so ready and it's not so on the radar, it's much better for us photographer because it makes so much fun to photograph. Nagaland, for example, Manipur and all the other areas there, they were just amazing for me and I, I uh, will go there definitely again. But how I told it is not on the big uh, um, focus on all photographers, so um, I cannot offer a big group tours there. Um, so, can we run photos now? Yeah, we, you can okay. uh, see photos. We have photos. We can maybe stay at the Lake Baikal. This is the next question. Then we show the photos about Lake Baikal and I answer one question about it and talk about it, okay? Sure. Uh, please play the slide, Rajesh. So there, um, there is one person, he asked the question um, about Lake Baitour, if this is only happened once a year. Yes, it happened only once a year because the time to go there, to be on the ice is very limited. There is many reasons for it. One is the ice has to be frozen and safe. The government opened the ice that you are allowed to drive on it uh, on around 10 to 15th of February and it will close yeah, beginning of March, 10th of March, I would say. And if the um, and I do only the tour there, then I'm completely safe and the government give green light. Many other photographers, they go earlier and go later, and the result is then have an accident and death because you drive on at least one meter thick ice the whole time and you want to be safe there, otherwise there is no escape. Last year, we had a wonderful uh, friend of mine, this on the tour in, Indi uh, in Lake Baikal. He is from India. He never saw snow and he never was on Arctic countries. And it was one of the coldest um, times in Russia. So he landed at minus 45 degrees and he was dressed like, like he's going to, <laughs> to the moon. And <laughs> he was freezing. <laughs> really hardly because he was not used. On the third day, um, he came up and we walked to breakfast <coughs> and it was minus 17. And he said, how it comes, it is so warm today. <laughs> so he, you see, it, it just very fast because uh, the it is cold air, but dry and dry air, you don't feel it so much. Uh, wet air would be much, much harder. So Russia and the Lake Baikal is every year and I have a wonderful cooperation with Gs. so please join. Everybody who loves ice or black ice um, has to go there. I have been around the world in Alaska, in Greenland, in Svalbard, in, in Antarctica, everywhere. But I tell you, the what is related to ice, because I love ice, of course, Iceland, 11 years. Um, if you really love ice and the magic of the ice, go to Lake Baikal, because there you feel it and you touch it and you see all types of ice in one place. And we have not only ice to photograph there uh, and um, caves, ice caves and um, so, ice structures and frozen trees and it's just amazing. Uh, I had one um, one friend of mine, he joined, he is a well photography instructor, he wanted professional, he offered as well tours. He said he wants to see it and then he said, but 10 days, this is way too much, I, I would be get bored. But um, when he was then with me there, he could not stop. And after the 10 days, he said, can we just do it again? Because it was so amazing. So the, the, now I jump here to the next question. Um, 
the, the, this is a very interesting. He said, can you tell us how do you plan your schedule? You travel a lot as well as active in Instagram. I'm also a travel photographer, but I hardly find time to edit my image in the database. Would be great if you share some comments to this. Yeah, this is a very, very tough question. Um, it is practicing because I have no time at all to go back to my images. So this means in short version, in the evening before I go to sleep, I have to be finished with my images from the day. This is sounds hard and this sounds impossible, but it is possible. You have to be very hard to yourself. You have to delete immediately every unsharpened image, every, every image what don't you uh, and, and suit you and what is not perfectly done in the field. This is the main point. If you shoot perfect in the field, you don't have to adjust much and you don't have to work much on it. If there is trash, then make the trash away. If the composition is not perfectly, then move to your side and, and, and. There are so many things. If you make it right in the field, you have less to do. So this means I, I, if I spend more than three minutes on an image to adjust it, I will go away because this means I lost to make it perfectly in the field. And then you're training yourself to make really only the best images and the images what you like perfectly in the field. And then you don't have much uh, work later on to do on your computer and in the evening and you can do it. Of course, there are some exceptions, like if you make tribes or portrait sessions, then you have hundreds of images that takes much, much more to go through because every, every second or half second, the mimic is different. Then you have to choose very carefully, but there I have as well some methods to do it. What I explain very well during my tours, um, that the people can do because I want from everybody as well that we sit in the evening together, share our work, sort out our best images and do them. And they learn during the tour to do exactly this point because um, in the beginning I saw uh, many repeating customers who uh, was a year before on a tour with me and they never looked back on the images. This is so sad because everybody has his eye and has wonderful images between and if they get lost, it's just sad. Uh, I provide internships. This is the next question. Yes, I provide. Um, I'm pretty busy, but I try my best. It really depends on what kind of internships. So if you are interested, uh, write me directly in email and I try to answer all of them and I will try to help all of you. I'm a sharing person, so no, uh, no doubt, just to write me what you have in mind. Please do it. Uh, so the next question is here about Greenland, what we see now on the screen as well, what I took, there are some Greenland images. The Greenland, uh, the three best, sorry, now I lost the question, how? Oh. Uh, there was the question, here's the question. Tell me the three best things I get if I travel with you to Greenland. So in Greenland, I have been science 2003 in all kinds of conditions, seasons, and um, time of the year's months. I choose now only the best months. And these are the three reasons. This is September. <clears throat> in September, you have, it's the end of the seasons, there is no tourist, what is in any effect not much, God bless, because there exist only 10 hotels and pensions in whole East Greenland where I go. So there's always pretty less tourists, but 
in September, uh, it get dark at six o'clock and we have at night as well the great northern light or aurora borealis and all the whales comes into the fjords and it is not windy. So this means the fjords are full of icebergs. The, uh, it is uh, mirrored because there is no wind, everywhere is reflection and you have Minky whales, sperm whales, blue whales, dolphins, seals, etc., etc. So there is a lot of wildlife. Greenland, I still love and I still do it. And I always love to go back because it is every time different. And the icebergs are so amazing there because they are not like in Antarctica, huge, like that you drive with your boat 20 minutes along and you see just the white big wall no in greenland there are house size up to house sizes and then all shades of colors and forms and and you would be amazed how much uh, beauty is in there um okay let's see what we have here more yeah, here is what kind of software I use. It's very simple. I use Lightroom. I use many other softwares because uh, I get, um, get them from the companies. What I recommend is if you don't have time and you don't want to do much, Photo Lemur is a wonderful one-click version and they do pretty good jobs. But if you want to go serious, then um, you have to do it in Lightrooms. I, I myself um, created a lot of plugins, what I'm, I share with my people who comes on my tour to make the workflow much faster because it's repeating if you make architecture or portrait or um, landscape, nature, close up, etc., etc. It's repeating. So there are some plugins or some uh, presets are very useful if you make them by them your own. And what is amazing is photo um, Lemur 4. Lemur 4 has extremely good um, functions. As well, I use uh, uh, the good old Nick software still and um, the highlight recoverer from Topaz, but this means I messed up in the field. <laughs> but this happened sometimes. Um, this is very good. Otherwise, I would say Lightroom, Photo Lemur, Lemur 4, and presets, then you are pretty well done. Um, tips for better photography. <laughs> this is a very good question. For, uh, tips to get better photography, it's never ending story and you never learn out and I could talk now for hours but the main tip is really shoot only what you like to shoot uh, because you submit so much in your images um, personal feelings and so much uh, things when I come home or I post images during the tour my wife she recognized my mood and if I'm powered off or etc. because she immediately say then what's up um, um, did you get too less sleep yeah when she seen image you submit incredible much in your image so please shoot only what you like to shoot then you make better photos the rest is really teaching over years and learning over years of course there is mathema mathematics behind there is uh, impressions behind, but the, the geometry, geometry is very important. What is as well very important is what the viewer knows. Um, the main thing is, for example, um, if you have object what everybody knows in your image, then it's always better because the viewer, if you recognize a rainbow, a wonderful waterfall, a puppy, a smiling person, etc., etc., it's always a bonus point. But if you want to have their critique, um, 
some images, what you have in mind, what you could do better, please send them to me. I'm happy to look at them and I would tell you what I would change. Um, next question is Czech Republic. Yes, I do have Czech Republic. Czech Republic is extremely well for autumn and spring. This is the most time what I like. So April, May or uh, October, November, because we have unbelievable history. So every corner is a castle and everything is green, a lot of forest, a lot of wildlife. So I do there and I make uh, Czech is very small, so we make more or less the whole country because if you are, um, fly into Prague, it takes you two hour, two and a half hours. It doesn't matter in which direction and you are on the border to the next country. Um, which camera or I use and which kind of lenses? Yeah, I'm, I started with Canon, so I'm stuck with Canon. It's very simple. It's mostly I never try to change because now I know all the mistakes um, um, from the camera, so I don't have to think. I just know it. The main point is it doesn't matter what camera brand you have. Um, it's only the questions for what you want to use it. Uh, Sony is without... Uh, any doubt the smartest on the market, but it is not so well built. This means, in my opinion, I cannot use it in harsh weather conditions like my Antarctica or uh, in humidity like, like, like the rainforest or so. There I see that Sony is always dysfunction after a while, but otherwise a great camera. The most important thing is really to have the good lenses. And this is tricky. You have to try different lenses. You have to ask the professionals what lenses they use and why they use it. I especially, I don't care if it's a Canon lens or Sigma or Tokina or Bova. It doesn't matter. If it's a good lens, I will use it. I have now in the moment uh, the Sigma 150, 600 uh, normal version is extremely good. Every or The most uh, birders use it. I have the Sigma 1635 uh, with f-stop 42. What is incredible is a very old lens. It's not anymore on the market. I have, of course, from Canon, the 24-105, the all-rounder, and the macro lens, the 50 prime for portrait, and the 1734 f4 part two, because it has the best starburst. This is more or less my standard lens is what I take with me and then you are pretty much cover everything what you need. Uh, my apps doing traveling. <laughs> this is a good question. My apps doing traveling. Um, yeah, you can have thousands of apps. Yeah, I have to say I, I organize a lot of uh, um, I think with my partners, my local partners, and these are as well professional photographers. So they know exactly where we have to go and why and when, what time, etc. And if it's not good, they know always a backup. But still, then you need a, a few apps like 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 Skyview, where's the Milky Way, um, how is the weather, good wind, etc., etc. PDM I use to when I need um, to locate when is the shadow, etc., on a building, and so on. So there's many apps out there. If you are really interested, uh, send me a line, and I, I send you what I have on my uh, phone because there are good ones out there. What you what I use still. A lot. Uh, um, I, if I take for the next question is, do you always show people photos, the photos you have taken of them? 
No, I don't. Because uh, it's like me. Uh, if I get photographed, I, I look so often silly in it. And this is why it don't exist much photos from me. Um, this is why I don't like it much. So, and then I'm very critical. If there is a, a, a mimic in it or whatever, then I, um, um, the eyes are closed, etc., etc. This I don't show them. But otherwise, if I think it is good, then I give them all the images and they can have them. And I show them. Um, now I see there's a lot um, a question about two operators abroad and so on. I, I will put them all together in one answer. Um, I have in every every countries or uh, districts in bigger countries is one professional photographer who knows the territorium in and out, and this is my partner and all the photography instructors has <clears throat> has this knowledge and knows exactly where to go and why and this who i have to cooperate if you have a special um, um, um country in mind or so um, like i said send me a line and i can give you there a good to operator um here is um, uh, Yamu from Kashmir, um, and he asked me if I have been there, and I answer you sadly, wise not. I have only been in Ladakh, and I did the charter track in winter, uh, what I extremely love. Uh, Kashmir, I only saw photos. I really would love to go. Um, it's high on my list. Then the other thing is here, if joining my tours, what we uh, offer um, over um, GE is, is about, the question is about visa process. So in Russia, it is um, complicated, more complicated than other countries because Russia, you need an invitation letter. So, but this is no problem. If you book with us, then you will get the um, invitation letter this you take to the embassy or you send it to the embassy or to your visa travel agent and with this invitation it is no problem to get your visa during four days otherwise for normal countries i i do not help because you only have to do it online or uh, to um, send it to the ne next visa agent or to the embassy, go to the embassy to get your visa. But if there is problems, of course, I will help always. But normally, uh, it is not uh, like my problem. But um, these days, it's pretty easy to get a visa to every country. Um, here is one person, he asked me the fifth five best places uh, uh, in India. This is good. Okay, <laughs> India is so incredible big and I would love to see uh, many, many areas more. I have been to Manipur, to Nagaland, Northeast, Bengal, Darjeeling, Shikkim, um, Surat area, Ladakh, Kerala, Mumbai, um, um, Accra and, and Rajasthan, this area I have seen until now, and all of them I love in one or other way, and every every destination has its minus or plus. <laughs> you cannot compare like all the countries, um, but I would love to see much more in India because this is so diverse and so interesting. And the difference between North and South, it's for me incredible to see. Um, uh, how much tweaking I do on my photos, as less as possible. <laughs> um, of course, sometimes if I'm tired or overdone, I make as well too much. And then I think after uh, looking back to my images, oh, holy cow, there I did a bit too much contrast or so on. This happened. So I suggest keep it low as possible. 
because um, like a photographer, you learn over years and the first 10,000 photos what you take and you optimize um, you have to be really hard and learn out of it and then you learn out of your mistakes and still if I look back from my first images from 1990s or 80s then I say to myself as well holy cow what the hell I have done but this is normal because otherwise it means you are stuck and you never learn and you never went forward. So what we have here more, we have so many questions here. Yeah, um, there's, there's a very interesting question. How, um, yeah, I, I just say the question, how do you make sure that the people who you photograph know and understand what their photos are going to be used for? What happens if someone see pictures of themselves and they don't or they aren't happy about it? This question is very simple. Never publish an image without any model release because it brings nothing. If you can identify the face, you have to ask the person, if you pay for the image, he automatically agree for it, that you can, um, he signed more or less a model release, but you, you, he has to sign that you have to pay for it. So if somebody asks you for a dollar in the street, like some holy people in, in, in Nepal, they ask me quite often, um, then I only have to have a witness. I had to pay for the image and then I can use it wherever I want. So, but otherwise there is a trick. If you, if you have a model release and you have a smiling person there, what working person and it fits incredible for this image, you need a model release to publish it or to use it for commercial things. Otherwise, you can only shoot them from behind that the face is not um, visible or recognizable, then you can do it. And this I do quite often. So let the people walk by and shoot them from behind. It's much more powerful or often more powerful. Otherwise, I recommend make model released. Then you are safe because these days um, you get easy problems and international laws are pretty hard and it can cost you a lot of money if they find out that you use it without agreement. Um, so how much planning goes into your photos? Do you have a picture in mind what you are going to take before even reach the country? Um, yes and no. Also the countries what I have been, I look at my portfolio and I look what I have done less or not so much. If I have like uh, Russia, a lot of ice images, then I try to get different ice or unusual images or I want to include more houses or more living or more um, people um, because I don't have this much. If I go to a new country, I set up a new tour like um, Turkey this year, for example, I do this, I use a professional local photographer who helps me out and it's no problem for me. Then I said, he has to set up how I want it and we go through the itinerary and he sent me some images and this it is. I will never look what I will see there or what I can see around the corner or what the other has done or shoot. This I never do because then I get influenced and I want to go to places what I would maybe never go. And this I don't like, so I get manipulated what kind of image I have to take if I look on thousands of images of Turkey or this area where I go, because I want to go there um, completely relaxed and open-minded and really shoot what I love to see and how I feel it. And, and, um, and I, I want to represent then my own view and not a copy of thousand others before. 
Um, here is a big question um, about um, from one person, how much money I make from photography. <laughs> also, to make it straightforward, uh, you never make money enough. It's very simple. If you make a lot of money, your, your standard goes higher and you need more money. So it's very simple. <laughs> so the answer is um, uh, photography is like every uh, other job in the art industry. At the end of the line, you have to work extremely hard and it's very low paid until you get a name. If you have a name, it's really on you. If you spoil it and, and you make commercial photography, then you can earn a lot of money per day, but you have to get a lot of gigs to get your year budget together. Then there are other photography instructors, they make a lot of money um, because they charge ridiculous amount for the tour. When you compare other tours with mine, you will see there are cheaper ones, there are expensive ones, there are ridiculous expensive ones. And uh, the middle class field is mostly this big, big group size, and then you have nothing out of it. But the instructor, you get a lot of money. So I'm extremely fair based, but I don't make much ma money out of the tour, but I get a lot of food. <clears throat> but money wise, it is not often about the money, it is often about the image by himself. It really it's a long to be successful in photography, it takes years and years and you have to have luck and the right connections, then you can make money. But if you're too greedy, you will pop out extremely fast. This I noticed from many, many colleagues and in all kinds of branches over the years. Um, if, you, if you're good and you're honest, then you are more than five years on the market. Otherwise, there's something wrong. So here's a, now now it goes a, a lot of um, very specific questions I see here about shooting. Okay, overcast, bad weather. How much adjustment you make to your techniques? Also it's very overcast is always terrible conditions, but it is awesome for black and white. So if it's really overcast and, and, and not much mood in it, then switch to black and white and you will be amazed how beautiful it is then. Otherwise, you can make as well a lot of close up, um, 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 not macro, but close ups from everything or just make all images without any skies. Bad weather, it don't exist bad weather for photographers. Um, I shoot in rain, in, in, in storm, in thunderstorm, in hail, in everything. Um, it makes fun and you can always do something. But overcast is really cut the sky off or switch to black and white and then it's stunning again. So it's always a technique or an image what you can do. Uh, which places are you desperate to visit after the lockdown? <laughs> yeah, also I have seen quite a lot and I repeat many countries, also 87 countries. I was touring and I was way over 100 countries, countries in the world by myself already. But I tell you the truth, the list is getting longer, not shorter. Um, <laughs> there are so many incredible places. Like I said earlier in India, in India I have seen quite a few places, but there are so many uh, places where I still want to go or where I got uh, so an image um, or there are some unique historical places where I really would love to go. But I tell you, um, um, I'm only happy if the lockdown will open and we can travel and we can save travel. This is the main question. Where it is, I really don't matter because every country has or every place has its own beauty. So um, I, have, of course, have some destinations 
where I want to go. And this is like, for example, Christmas Island. This is one place that I would love to see personally. <clears throat> What tech do you take with you when you travel? Tech, I try to minimize as much as possible because I don't like to carry so much shit around. I have a good friend of mine. He's a phase one photographer. He comes with 210 kilo equipment. He has the money to travel like this and he pays heavily for all this money, but until he is ready with the phase one to capture and set up all his gear. It takes him quite a time. So um, it is not for street photography. Let's say it like this. I keep it simple and minimize so much I can because I want to have everything in my backpack and then I walk happy around and shoot whatever comes. Mm. So now I have here. <clears throat> I think I have here pretty much done some questions. So guys, when you have really new questions, please ask directly and uh, make it very specific because it's easier for me because the most uh, 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 the most um, answer started in photography in any case by it depends on what you do so if you make it straightforward i have much more out of it um about the um i saw there were some people interesting in in in, in ethiopia in ethiopia we have a lot of different different um, uh, tribes to visit. So this is mainly tribe photography and portrait photography, what is amazing. The other tour, Kyrgyzstan is an amazing country. Actually, I like it more than Iceland because it's the diversity of the landscape is so impressive and so in so many shapes or different styles like in Iceland. Um, so this is an all-round tour, and the Lake Baikal is the main focus on ice, so on, on Arctic sites. Um, so if you have specific questions to these three tours, I can answer this. Otherwise, I will please put them in the questions, then I see them. Otherwise, I will go on here in the questions. Um, also here is one question about the tribal in, in, in uh, Ethiopia, when I capture them. It is tricky um, to capture them, but um, it really depends on you. And I teach everybody when we start, we go first to some easier ones and it will get then um, more uh, difficult or more challenging to to get good images, but the main point is really how you are. If you completely respect this person in front of you and get personal and talk to them and interested in their culture and drive and ask them questions, then is there no problem to capture them in all kinds what you want. But if you only run there and say smile and make an image, then you will get a bad smile, a fake cheese and nothing else. But otherwise it's like every portrait photo or street photography as well. The tribes are really nice and they're actually very interested in you. Um, when we come there, um, I was at a Mursi tribe and there we had to drive two hours from the next small village to come there. And there came a little boy and he he pointed at my hand and he said coronavirus. So he everything what he knows is there is coronavirus already out there, but the Africans don't have it. 
um, only the white people. And I was so fascinated. So we talked about coronavirus with the tribe and everybody was so interested because they only heard about it from someone and had not much clue. So we were discussing and then they opened so much that we had then so incredible um, sessions, photo sessions with dancing and, and, and we joined their dancings and they joined our dancings and we could really photograph a lot. So it's really depends on how you open and how you go to them. <clears throat> Um, as well, when people, you always have to ask people, definitely, if you want to photograph them. Earlier, I said that have a model release at Tribes. You cannot make a model release, but they, some of them, they get as well paid or we give the whole clan, we, we um, give them money. So this means um, that we are allowed to visit them to help them to build a new hut, or et cetera, et cetera. So this means we paid as well, or agreed to make images. So then we have the, our model release, so we can use these images, but otherwise on the street, you have to always ask if people say no or whatever, you have to respect this. And then you look around and turn around and you see another wonderful person with a wonderful, face what you want to photograph. <clears throat> um, here's a in very interesting question about how did you find your own photography style and what do you think about when you edit your photos? The main thing is really, uh, I really photograph only what I shoot. I never have done weddings. I never have done children photography or studio photography or so because I hate this when the people come and say smile, smile, and you have to make an image and they stand somewhere pressed against the wall. This was never my, my thing. So I never liked it and God bless, I never had to do. So my style is really, I cannot describe it. It is my style is just what I love, this is my style. Of course, everybody has his unique style and you see it and I see as well if I go in Instagram or in Facebook or so and I see um, photographers who has been with me on tour or um, professional photographers. Um, then if I see an image after years, I know exactly who took it. If I know the person, yeah, because everybody has a signature or a style in it. And this is what I really love, uh, like, like uh, Jack Graham or uh, Dean Tattoos, or um, there are so many out there, good photographers, um, they have their own style and um, you just have to show me an image and I can tell you who shoot it if it's a professional photographers because everybody do it in a different angle or different uh, view. <clears throat> um, here's a question about, um, are you ever tempted to just use a small compact digital camera or, or big heavy equipment? I have to say I, I'm sponsored as well from Fuji and I have the Fuji, Fuji camera um, as well. But the main point is if you have there the right lenses, they're all from metal. And so in the end of the story is as well very heavy. But I have five kids and all of my kids, they have professional and compact camera depending on their age but there exist extremely good ones out there my my kids i just bought them the new sony compact ones because they all are crazy like me shoot around uh, and these days the the camera it it really doesn't matter which camera you have it depends on the size on the resolution it don't has to be much more over 30 million pixels. I make there now a line because 
you never blow up that much your images. You don't want to make highway billboards or etc. to print it that big. So you don't need the resolution. And if you uh, don't shoot uh, just without any thinking, an image in the nature, and you crop it then down extremely because you find something in your image what you want to have, then you don't need this high resolution. So I think everything what is over, uh, under, uh, up to 30 million pixels is perfect. 20 to 30 is more than enough. So um, if you have the good camera, um, compact camera, it's just incredible. I know one instructor, photography instructor, he only used the iPhone or a smartphone. Yeah, so, and he print this these days, the, the new smartphone has now 100 megapixels, what you never need. Yeah, uh, but it's incredible good software behind and they make extremely good images as well. It's, it's the eye and the photographer and not the gear. And to to make that little thing, I when I was the first time in, in Iceland in Greenland, I had a small compact camera from Olympus, what I love because of the color space. Um, and I shoot on a um, we drove by speedboat fast to another thing, and I didn't want to take my professional gear with me. So I took only this the small one and I took an image with this camera with the Olympus Ultra Zoom. Um, it was a very uh, cheap camera, but extremely good. So and over the years, over 10 years later, I found out this is the most selling or the most profitable image what I ever have done. And this was with the Olympus Ultra Zoom compact. So it is really not the camera. Um, the smartphone and, and there's the similar question if you use only smartphones or cell phones to make images, it is exactly the same. You have to learn all the rules or many rules um, about photography. The main photography rules of third and the golden spiral and so on. This are um, the beginner or the, um, some rules what everybody learns when he starts. They are as well very important. And um, But if you go deeper and deeper, there exist hundreds and hundreds of rules. And um, what you can learn, you don't have to, but what you can learn, they make all sense and they are really good. And uh, the composition of an image and why this object is there and not there and why the light is like this, etc. It's so, so important as well. The mathematic rules, the geometric rules that you bring geometric in, in it, that you have leading lines, that you have invisible leading lines, like eyes, where the eyes are looking. Um, the, uh, um, that you watch the highlights or the black that you use, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many, many rules. If you want to look there deeper, there exists uh, from a colleague of mine, a wonderful book, Michael Fry, uh, The Photographer's Mind or The Photographer's Eye. He has a book out there it's, as well, like an ebook, um, what has unusual composition rules, but they're so amazing. And if you know them and read them quite a while, repeat these ideas, then um, you improve your composition extremely. So and this you have to learn as well, even if you shoot with uh, compact cameras or smartphones, because uh, an image is like a painter. And when you go back, Van Gogh, Picasso, etc., all the landscape painters, Monet, Picasso, not, but Monet and Van Gogh and so on, they used exactly many of these rules as well because and it makes sense and you see it immediately why it works so
Um, here's a question from all the countries with the most diverse photo opportunities. Also, if you, like me, don't want to travel much around doing the tour, um, and you have yeah, many different kinds of landscapes or of opportunities, then it's definitely um, Kyrgyzstan and Iceland. In Kyrgyzstan, for example, we have been more in the morning shooting in a Grand Canyon similar uh, area. Uh, sunrise in the afternoon, we were in flower fields from Akalai and um, Edelweiss, uh, and so uh, sheep herders and uh, horse herders. And in the afternoon and sunset, we have been on a glacier. And this this driving try time from only one hour between the destinations. And this is insane. So if diversity, I would say, with less traveling time doing the tours, Iceland or Kyrgyzstan. Otherwise, if you take India and you fly around, then you have as well own diversity what you want. You live as well in an extremely stunning country what photography was. Yeah. Um, so the, here's a question about average shot of great travel photos. I try to don't do. Of course, if I was in uh, Taj Mahal, I photographed Taj Mahal, but I tried to make um, compositions what I didn't know of or never saw before. I didn't Google it, but I tried to make my thing. And I tried to make it not only, okay, there you have from left to right um, this object, Eiffel Tower, like in Paris or whatever. So I tried to include in a storytelling image to, to make a typical travel photo shot from the Eiffel Tower that I have a sitting couple in the, in, in the tree in a leading way to the Eiffel Tower. What is no problem to do in this location. I would not photograph it by his own, only the Eiffel Tower. Or I would go so close that I make abstract of the symmetry of the building by itself. <clears throat> Yeah. So I, I give it back to you, my friend. Um, do you have some specific questions from your side? Yeah. Some of the generic questions are coming on our social media. So, Tim, first of all, thank you for answering so many questions. Yep. <laughs> Before I ask a question, would it be possible for you to uh, walk through some of your images which are running in your background and any story behind that and, you know like if you could give a little overview then probably that would be great because these are images but most of us or most of the users they don't have any idea what they want to do or they may ask certain questions based on that so how i took this image and how to come there you mean yeah not all, but if any image you think that has some story behind. Yeah, okay. So also in the moment we see <laughs> exactly this photo from this friend but who what I mentioned earlier, who traveled with 210 kilo of equipment. Um here we have the images from Lake Baikal. So this image um it's unique. <clears throat> because it is cold out there. Uh, the average, it's minus 10 to minus 40. What is challenging? Of course, we have to jump always back to our cars, what um, is behind us in this case, um, to warm up uh, or to, to eat, to drink, to have a coffee, to have snacks, or etc. But the main point here is to come there, to be out there. You see in the background, this is just ice. You have to imagine the Lake Baikal is the biggest freshwater lake in the world. This means six, yeah, nearly 700 kilometers times 100 kilometers big, only frozen ice. 
and this is um, incredible, beautiful and slippery. So you drive there uh, uh, around and you find formations, structures, fantasies, um, ice um, sculptures, etc., etc., ice bubbles we saw earlier. And um, the challenge here is to see the image, to feel the image, to have luck with the weather. If it's overcast, like I said earlier, turn to black and white. But the challenge is as well then to handle with the situation, not only the weather, the temperature, it is as well just to walk on ice. <laughs> On the first days, it will be extremely slippery and you will be very carefully, but you get, you, you cannot imagine how fast you get used to it. Also all my attendees, it is now, next year will be my sixth year when I go there, they run after a while over the ice with no crampons, without anything, because you get you so used to it. <clears throat> but, there it is often that um, you don't often see the image. Like in this case, um, we drove by by this um, image and um, the, the, we were searching for a nice structure and um, of, of the eyes to capture this image. And I didn't saw it. And he said, can we stop here? I, I, I want to photograph this. And so we stopped all. And then 10 minutes later, the sky turned so extremely nice, moody in these colors. And the reflection came out. It, it was before overcast, but then the sun up, uh, came down and the colors came out. And we got an incredible session of this image. So there is really, when you look at the other images, for example, the uh, ice bubbles. Can you show me this image, please? <clears throat> the ice bubbles, they for example, they're amazing. These are meta frozen, methane gas bubbles frozen in the lake. So you have to think you walk, walk around and everywhere comes meta gas bubbles. This is a, this is a, a a crystal ball, what you can buy, and we play quite a lot with it. They are used, for example, as well, this wonderful canon lens, what I mentioned earlier, the 1635 F4 part version 2, because it just makes an incredible starburst. How you see, I mean, this is not a full one, this is straight out of the camera. And in this image, I um, make only. Um, normal Lightroom adjustment without any workflow or uh, AI behind. This is straight done in the field. Yeah. There you see how the ice is. <clears throat> yeah. the, um, to come back to the methane gas bubble, the methane gas bubbles are very chain challenging to photograph because if you go above it, it is very hard because you don't see the lovely layers and the light playing. And if you, or you get your own shadow in or your own reflection. And um, if you go too wide, then it gets lost. So, but every time when we come there, it's a challenging and everybody try to photograph um, the bubbles over hours and never can get enough. And then, I, me as well. Every time when we see them, we make this over hours and we try and we talk to each other to how to make this better because it's so challenging to do, to get the right angle with the, with the light, with the position and the point of view to get an, a nice image. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, um, we saw earlier, can you go back please to the Kyrgyzstan images? Then I can open one. Um, yeah. yeah, for example, this one with the tree, with the tree. This, one. this image, for example, this is in a valley. We chose this valley to go there um, um, because there were hot springs. We hired a Russian um, a military car to come. Up there. 
because there was the no road, it was all, we drove there in this case, two hours up to come to this valley because there are hot springs. Um, we shoot everybody the hot springs and it was nice images with steam, but in the end of the day, we hiked around in the valley. In the background, you see some glaciers and alpine um, um, mountains. This was on three and a half thousand meters. And we came along all these incredible trees who try to survive on a stone and the roots go down. And um, we captured there then this image and they had to walk to this image around yeah, one hour. But during the walk, we got many other images. But in the end of the day, it was my favorite one because it is so unusual to see the nature, how it's tried to su survive. Yeah? And it is uh, challenging. And I bet this photograph, nobody so fast, other photographers will go to this area um, to get these images because there were hundreds and hundreds of this kind of trees. But um, uh, yeah, it is always just look around and, and try to capture what you like. It's really, really very, very important. Never copy someone, try to, um, to capture what you like. Um, uh, Tim, I have a question. Yeah. Someone had asked you about India that what you have traveled. You did mention Leh Ladakh, but yeah. I, guess, I guess the story and that that's incredible. If you could just give a little brief about those who are not aware of that would be great. Your pregnant lady story. Uh, about uh, Ladakh? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Ladakh was quite very, very interesting. Um, I was uh, it was very early in the two thousands. I was in Iceland sitting, and um, my good friend he makes um, living on the edge, um, the earth on the edge, um, the Syria, and then they reported about this uh, father who bring his son, I think it was, over the frozen river um, to, to school. And I saw this before it came out because he showed me all the footage, what he had before he cut it. And then I said, oh, I, I have to go there and make their photography too. So I set up one with my good friend from, from India in this area and we went there. And I never have been there before. And this is similar like Iceland, uh, like, sorry, sorry, like Russia. You have to walk over the Chatter Track, over the frozen river, 10 days to Lynx Head. So over the frozen river, hopefully everywhere frozen river, we had to pass several um, um, stations <laughs> by water, also until to the knee in the cold water. But um, on the second day, I had the luck or um, to um, find uh, three people: a mother with a newborn baby, her husband, and her mother, also the, the mother-in-law of the husband, and. Um, she just returned from the hospital with a small newborn baby in a basket <laughs> uh, wrapped in a carpet to go home to Lingshed. And I was shocked. Um, she showed me the baby. The baby was blue frozen and, and we warmed it up and we, she gave her food. And, and we were in the beginning of our tour as well. It was the second day. So we had eight eight days more to go. And I was so impressed from the power of this woman, what she's going through, because she told me then the story. She, They had to plan the pregnancy that they are able when they, are, they want to, when the time is right to deliver the baby, they have to go down to the hospital, I'm highly pregnant, over the frozen river to come to the next hospital. And then when the baby is born, they have to go back with the baby. 
So I photo document this and I, um, of course, after the third day, she was part of our tour and had our food and, and, and we gave her one tent and warmer things for the baby. And we followed the whole time. And I decided I want to publish this story. So I published this story and I was, I knew there will be political um, things behind and everything. So I wrote it uh, um, and especially only from the viewpoint how amazing this woman is, what she has done without any question behind and why and, and et cetera. So this story went then viral in all over the world. Even the Times of India printed, it came like a slideshow in the, in the television in India. The main thing was then the result was I was then more or less a bit banned. <laughs> yeah, and now the images of Chatter Track <laughs> of this amazing woman. Uh, yeah, um, I was then more or less banned in 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 India. Different view point of view than me because I just wrote how amazing this woman is, and they saw thought, um, yeah, maybe it's a tech about India. So, but so when every time after this, when I wanted to go to India. Um, I had to sign an extra paper that I'm not allowed to publish any story. So, but after four years, everything changed. And I got suddenly what I still get, and this is really nice, um, letters and emails and little pictures from this town in Linkshead because they changed it. They brought a doctor up there that this woman don't have to go in their pregnancy down over the chatter track. So all the kids and the kids who are born there, they sent me now letters because I changed something. And the government of India, God bless, changed as well. And they saw that I really mean it in the good way, in the human way. And I didn't want to attack anyone or any political situation and anything. They changed them as well after this four years. And now I'm cooperating with the government and they invite me quite often to um, different destinations like for example December I was in Nagaland to photo document uh, Nagaland and to promote this more because there comes very less tourists and it is just such a great incredible event to see from all the tribes but anyhow this woman and, and uh, mother and daughter, it is just amazing what they have done and what they went through. And uh, I just loved it to see and be a part of it. Okay. And this, yeah. So this is how a photographer can change, um, can make a lot of changes. Like they have a doctor, but the whole, and probably you are the first one and the last one to document that. Yeah, now we have a doctor. Exactly. There are so many things out there. What what is not nice to see and what is not good and so. But I think if 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 um, I have photojournalism background as well, and this is the point. If 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 you put it in a different light everybody understand it and then it change. So if you see the slums, the slums are ne terrible and uh, um, terrible things happen in terrible situations. But if the people don't talk about and don't show, look, they so this family survive in this area and, and they do it like this and this, then nobody talks about and it's just get forgotten and then it will never change. You know? So I do quite often things like this, like in the Hammer tribe, they do as well whipping. So I, I make several stories about the whipping that this stop, because this is these days not uh, necessary to do anymore. <laughs> in my so, opinion. Yeah. Uh, Tim, we have some questions like, which is the most like top friendly country? 
the hate. most what friendly top friendly where people are most friendly and where people are not friendly at all like according to you as a photography perspective yeah okay yeah mm, this is really hard to tell bad guys are everywhere <laughs> it's really simple there are there are welcoming people and, and not welcoming people bad guys are everywhere in every country but i have to say until now i never had a bad experience or such bad experience that I would say I would not go there back in this country because the people are unfriendly. Of course, there are um, some, some are more closed to foreigners and some not, but if you smile and if you're open and, and, and just take them how they are and talk to the people on the, on the market where you are when you are there longer for a time, then it's no. But I, I would not say that. I, I, I think I'm optimist. I think every country there are, God bless, more than enough good people. Uh, okay, great. So the language barriers it is an interesting question. Yes, there are barriers. I, I, I speak nine languages, uh, um, and I I can come around. But of course, if you come to a tribe in Ethiopia or in the Amazon or whatever, that helps you no languages at all. Then you have to try to make pantomime, uh, sign languages, etc. And then it's a lot of fun. They laugh, you laugh, and they are open up completely because they see you want to talk to them. <laughs> and, and then it's the same game. You win them on your side and you can capture and you can get out something, mostly. Uh, Tim, you have captured so many tribes, uh, which is the most, like, uh, can you hear me, Tim? Sometimes, um, sometimes it is difficult um, to make them clear um, that you photograph and that you're on their sides. Because um, if you are two, it's much easier because then you are not so attackable. But uh, otherwise, it is always better to travel in two. It's not scary or not. Uh, I don't want to scare anyone, but if you go with two, it's better. Yeah. Because you have values on you. And when you go in areas as in deep, deep market or, or uh, so, I was just in Addis Ababa, they are in a recycling market. I would never go alone there inside, deep inside, and there, there suddenly 20 men stand around me. Yeah. But but it's much safer if you don't go. Yeah. Go join a group or find a partner and go with him. It's it's better. Because otherwise you they get your equipment or your your personal stuff. <clears throat> Yeah, now we see images of the Morsi tribes. It's one of the very interesting tribes in the Omo Valley in Ethiopia. They make incredible, beautiful uh, body painting and scarves on their bodies. <clears throat> and the slip plates, uh, they're incredible. This is actually a pretty small one. I, I bought from one woman one lip plate because I couldn't believe how big this lip plate is. They carve them out of timber and the diameter is 20 centimeters. So 20 centimeters. She had to cut out four teeth to get it in. This was the biggest I ever have seen. I have it now <laughs> disinfected 
and in my museum, my little private museum, because it's just insane how big they can be, these lip, lip plates. Yeah. Action cameras um, depends as a time lapse camera or, or to make time lapse um, and so on. Um, I do, and I have with me, if you have a GoPro or, or other brands who can make time lapse, it's always useful and very, very nice to do. I would take them with, with you. They take, don't take much space and you can have wonderful results during a location. You just let run some very nice time lapse of the clouds and landscape, changing landscape. It's just incredible. Hello, Tim. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from uh, one of our viewers. Like, uh, how do you deal with the barrier that you face when you travel to and uh, completely different country. Completely different language. Like uh, to a place where you haven't been. And um, how I approach this? Yes. Yeah. How do you approach them? The people there, and how do you get through your uh, expedition and all? Can you uh, yeah. tell us? Please? So um, you mean for? I didn't get the question completely. Please, can you repeat? Uh, our, one of our viewers wanted to know how do you deal with your expedition when you visit a new country where you haven't been? Like, uh, how do you overcome the language barrier you face and the cultural difference? Yeah, yeah, okay. Also, in, in my case, um, I set always up the tours that I have uh, local guides, local uh, partners, and translators yeah so in the omo valley for example um, i have when we go to these tribes i have their one dialect specialized and he specialist and he can speak eight dialects of 11 tribes what we visit so um then we can communicate with them but um otherwise you are on your own, but in the all, if it's not tribes, we have always uh, um, translators with us who do with us and for you the communication. Like in in in, in Kyrgyzstan, for example, there is is it like this? We don't speak the language, but our guide, um, we only tell um, when we're on the market, we say um, how much cost this, then he translate word by word what we say and we can interact with every person on the market on the street and this is no problem and this we do with all photographers the drivers i i usually use um only land cruisers that i have uh, three people in the land cruiser plus drivers this has two two um points behind why i do it like this because First, we have space enough, we, we, everybody has a good view, and we have a driver who speaks our language and the local language. So this driver, when he's not driving, he's always walking with us around, and then at least we have for every three people um, one driver plus a guy plus a local photographer. So it means we have for, for six people, we have five people who speak the language. So we are then always covered. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, another question is, what is the most surprising experience you had while working with these tribes? Something weird, weird means that may be weird for us. What is your experience which you were taken kind of, you know, off guard? Yeah, for me, it's uh, these tribes. For example, we saw it here in the images, what we saw on the screen. Um, the Hammer tribe, uh, the Mursi and Sumi tribe, they scarf themselves. There you see it on the um, body, all the scarves. This are very uh, old tradition, what is very precise, cutted to get really um, big scarves. 
and they they make very nice ornaments and structures on it. But the Hammer tribe, they have two rituals, what is pretty weird and what I was very surprised of. And I had to talk to many of them to understand why they do it. This is one, the whipping. <coughs> this is the wedding ceremony. The woman um, is going to the future husband's family to pick a man, also the uncle or brother or whatever, from the future husband who that he whips her. Yeah. So, and he has to whip her pretty hard because she she will stand in there and we will photograph this during the tribe when there is a wedding. And, and he whips her hard. And the bigger the scarves are, that the more love this woman shows his future husband. Yeah. So she is preparing it. She make her skin very soft with oils and so that it really get big scarves. And it is for me, I mean, when you see it every time, terrifying because they really hit hard. Uh, and and these are big, big, big scarves, and it hurts only the sounding. Photographing, I like not to photograph. I, I have two or three images where you see the, the result of it. But I, I didn't understand it, why they do it. But it is so deep in their culture, and um, this shows respect. And so I talked my once, three years ago, my sister was on tour with me, and she is doctor, and she... Um, talk then with the woman because from woman to woman it's much easier and she looked at the scarves um, if they held well and, and if they're okay and, and she talked to them and they were so proud of and, and she couldn't believe how proud they are so it is so deeply in them to do it and for us so yeah we cannot understand it I, I put it more or less in a way in our Western culture, it is more or less like BDSM or something. It, there's as well people who like it. So I put it this way or see it like this way. Yeah. So there are cultural rituals what you could get confronted with, like, like the lip plates, for example, as well. The lip plate comes from the past when they use... use um, um, when the slavery market was so big, these tribes were just afraid that they took the beautiful women. So they make these huge lip plates that nobody wants to steal this woman. And from there comes this culture. So, and now these days I saw some, also this year I saw two little girls in the tribe who didn't start it to prepare the ears or the lips. So that is changing because they recognize it is not necessary anymore. And they get in, in the school teached sometimes or they hear about, they don't have to do it. So it, there is changing coming now in the lip plates and in the ear plates. Um, what is sad but understandable as well on both sides, yeah. Uh, so, Tim, when you visit these tribes, what kind of do you carry any kind of gift for them or any things which they like which you carry to become more friendly? And uh, what's your how do you do it? Um, but also, we, we bring them sometimes for the kids a uh, ball to play or so on. But otherwise, um, normally um, they're untouched. And we, we try to find, especially the Hammer tribes, always villages who were not confronted with tourists before, that we get the real living, how they live in this village, in this community, that we can experience this without any faking and um, setups or anything. And, and then it is... Um, mostly like this, that all the people comes to you and you are the attraction and not them. Because for them, it's more <laughs> exciting. Why is this white person there and want to photograph us now suddenly? And this is then actually nice. So it flips actually the game. Yeah. But 
gifts or uh, um, um, we don't drink with them and don't eat with them because it would be not safe for your stem stomach. Our stomach is not built for this. Um, okay. So have you been any kind of a danger situation or kind of a life-threatening situation while these many years? Any experience you would like to share? In what kind of situation? Life-threatening. Life-changing. Uh, yeah. Threatening, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, if you travel a lot, you have a lot to tell. And life-changing things is really... Um, yeah, it's quite interesting because, because I see it differently than the most people. And here, when I go here in the evening into a pub and have a drink with my colleagues, I see that they are not experienced enough because you learn so much during the traveling. But what the most I am learned and what was life changing for me is it is really doesn't matter where you live and how you live and if you have the newest iPhone or whatever, yeah, uh, material status symbols and all these things. I I don't care if it's a jeans from Levi's or second hand jeans. If it's good, I have it. Then I'm fine. This may be changed. I don't live like poor or like a homeless. I I want my luxus as well, but I. I definitely learn from people in poorer area. The most important thing is the health and the, your family and the joy and nothing else. And this I learned and this spring brought me back many times with my family now to spend more time with family to, to learn this. This is more important and don't send your parents to, to um, um, yeah, retirement uh, apartment. Let them live with you because they raised you and and so on. There are many things for you. Know. Uh, we have it. Thank you, Tim. We have a question, a common question from many people: How yeah. to make a career as a travel photographer? What are the different venues you make money? And there are only few successful travel photographers, those who do it, uh, you know, they have this is as their first job, main source. Yeah. Of job. And in India, comparatively, there are not many. So how would you suggest people to go about and what they should do? Yeah, this is a hard topic and hard to answer these days. Also in the moment, also the actual stand is um you have to be known out there with your work this is the main point first travel around um, so much you can or set up a portfolio and and work from your area where you live to to show the world what you are able of what you like there are so many ways where you can go. You can be travel photographer, you can be instructor, commercial photographer, etc., etc. There are so many ways, and every way is pretty hard. But the main part is always you have to be. Um, they have to know your work. You have to get known over the years with your style, and it takes many years to come up. Many years. It can go fast, but it goes then as well fast down. But um, everybody who wants to do it, the, in the moment is very uh, modern. Um, they call them travel bloggers. They write to hotels, give me a free night, I will write article. And then they put this article, I was in this wonderful hotel in, in Delhi. And this was a wonderful dinner. So they got it for free and they post it on the website. This is a good step to start because they come around the world for more or less free and they build up a huge follower base and the people get known their work and then they can switch to other brands like um, commercial photographer, travel photographer, instructor, etc. But it's a long way. But if some has 
somebody has specific ideas or goals, he can write me and I can look at it, what he is doing, and then I can refer him some, maybe some, some names where he can, who could help him in this direction, as a, in commercial photography, or because I have so many professional um, fashion photographers on my tours and on commercial photographers and so on and so on, who comes as well with me and who are friends of me, where I'm happy to redirect um, and they can help them better if they want to go in this direction. If they want to be photography instructor or travel photographer, then they should write to me directly and I can look at their work and can suggest them their ways directly. Uh, thank you, Ken. We are almost done with the session. Um, there is, as uh, suggested, like in our email, we would be sharing you a recording of this program. You can, we will be sharing you the social handles of Tim. Feel free to ask any question directly. Also, please do donate for the cause. Uh, we have a link on our website. Uh, Tim, any last thought, any, any, before we sign off, like uh, any closing uh, from you? Anything yeah. You I know you're all photographers and you all love to travel. One big point is take always your camera with you every day. Be a nerd, be crazy, doesn't matter. But if you shoot a lot and if you capture, even in the supermarket, I take it with me. I have always my camera with me. Take it with you, then you shoot much more, you see more things, you learn to see more things, and you practice much more. This is my my hint to you. Practice, practice, and learn out of it. And take always your camera. It is always something to shoot out there. Yeah, and I thank you for being here and that you had so much interesting questions. And I hope to see many of you in our She Is uh, photo tours, maybe in Kyrgyzstan, Ethiopia, or Lake Baikal. This would be one. Thank you very much to all. Uh, yeah, so thank you, thank you, Tim. Your tours would be live soon. Um, you can register over there. And thank you, Tim, for all your valuable time. And stay safe, stay home. Thank you, everyone. It was lovely session. And thanks once again. Thank you very much to you as well and to the background team what I spoke before and who do all this technical stuff behind. Thank you very much and stay all safe. You have nothing else than your health. Be careful. <laughs>